Hola, chess people. Coach Matthew back with a chess lecture. This video will be the first in a series of longer videos where I present material that I've lectured for the past two decades for my U2200 crowd. And this channel and my material in general is intended to prepare students for open section play, U2200. This is one of my favorite games. I first came across it in Grandmaster Sarawan's Winning Chess Tactics book. I highly recommend that book and that series as well. They're fun reads and very exciting material. That was the first book I chess book I ever read. Players in this game, we have Grandmasters Gary Kasparov with the white pieces and Ulf Anderson with the black pieces. This was played in the 1981 Interpolis Tilburg Tournament. In 1980, Gary Kasparov was world junior champion. In the 81-82 Soviet Chess Championship, he tied for first. In 1982, Kasparov was the youngest participant in the candidates since Bobby Fischer. His style of play is to overwhelm the opposing king with superiority of force in a decisive attack. Grandmaster Anderson's a strong positional player who excels in the endgame. At this point, he had been in the upper echelons of chess for a decade, and Kasparov was on his way all the way to the World Chess Championship several years after this game was played, three years. Let's jump into the game. Now, my commentary will be applicable to beginners, quote, intermediate, whatever that means, experts, and everyone else in between. Here we go. D4. The theme of the opening is central control. Generally speaking, early in the game, you want to increase options for your pieces. Allow them to go to more squares. The more options your pieces have, the more options they can give you. Beginners are advised to open with a center pawn. That means put a pawn in the center of the board. The center is e4, e5, d4, d5 on their first move. Anderson plays for the center without putting a pawn there with knight f6. This restricts pawn e4, so Kasparov plays pawn c4. Anderson plays e6, and Kasparov plays knight f3. Here we see a queen's Indian defense with b6. The idea is to fianchetto with bishop b7. When playing such a move like b3, b6, g3, or g6 to fianchetto the bishop, you'll want to fianchetto on the very next move. If black never plays bishop b7, He's taken on a color complex weakness on the queen side for no good reason. So consistency is important with a chess player. You want your moves to be consistent. So if you play a move to allow the bishop to fianchetto, a knight pawn up one, then fianchetto the bishop on the following move. If you don't, you might never have a chance to do so. So b6, and Kasparov has a favorite system he plays against the Queen's Indian. It is the Petrosian system which is pawn a3. This restricts b4, and the f8 bishop pretty much has one square to move to, which is e7. If it were to go to d6 with that knight on f6, we would see a knight c3, potentially followed by an e4 push to e5. So a3, and Anderson Fianchettos with bishop to b7, and Kasparov now plays knight c3. Notice how this is a d-pawn system. In d-pawn systems, you may not want to limit your c-pawn with your queen's knight. So basically, you want to be able to use the c-pawn to help in the center. So don't block your c-pawn with a knight in d-pawn systems. After knight c3, I would suggest pawn d5 for black, but we see Anderson start to go astray and play knight e4. 
keep in mind, I have not seen or heard either player's commentaries on this game. So I really don't know what his ideas were with knight e4. However, this move invades. Invasion is a big deal. Invasion in chess is a very big deal. e4 is in white's territory, on white's half of the board. So it's easier for white to get to, to access, to attack e4 than for black to get there. It's closer to white's pieces. How should white react to this knight e4? Treat it as a target. That being the case, how can we weaken e4? By taking. Kasparov takes on e4. Of course, the bishop has to take back. Now, the question is, how do you attack this bishop correctly? Of course, you can approach a target from multiple angles. How should this bishop be approached? Most of my students suggest knight g5. What do you think about knight g5? Go ahead and pause the video. Knight g5 would be making the same mistake that black has just made with bishop e4. Of course, having to play that after the knight e4. Knight g5 invades, and black will respond with bishop b7, and then kick that knight out with bishop b7, h6, something along those lines, and the knight will have to leave. Now, if you're invading and are inducing a weakness, that's fine. You provoke a weakness, then you get out of there. No problem. But if that's not the case, you're invading, you get repelled, then you're going to have to go back again to that square. You're going to have to pay for the same real estate twice. Uh-uh. Knight g5 would be inaccurate. Here, we see knight d2. Now this bishop has to withdraw. It's going either to g6 or to b7. Where should it go? Go ahead and pause the video. The bishop likes to attack, yes, but it also likes to be stable. It likes stability. It doesn't want to move around a whole bunch. It's akin to a sniper. A sniper doesn't want to get up and move, get up and move, get up and move. No, it wants to go to one location and shoot. The bishop is no different. So this bishop, of course, with pawn b6, making a cubby hole for the bishop on b7, it belongs on b7. But Anderson moves it to g6. Now, at this level, players are not going to tactically blunder. They do blunder. Masters blunder, grandmasters rarely, rarely blunder. But it does happen, but it's probably not ever going to happen when you play against them. So what's our approach? We want to key in on the space left behind. The space left behind. This last move of Anderson's, bishop g6. What does black leave behind? Well, let's mark it. Leaves behind the entire, OK, that arrow just failed. Not the square, the arrow. There we go. It leaves behind the a8, h1 diagonal. Now, is this diagonal potentially valuable for a bishop? Well, yeah. Look at all the empty squares on it. So bishop e4 to g6 left this diagonal behind. What should white do? You grab the diagonal. You play g3. That's what we see Kasparov do. Anderson plays knight c6. Developing with a threat. When you bring out a new piece in the opening, make a real threat so as to reduce the opponent's options. Here, Kasparov has to make a decision about what to do with respect to the threat on d4. What should white do? Well, play e3. Pawns like to guard other pawns. Black now plays a6. A little slow. Preparing b5. Question is, should black play b5 after a6? Well, let's find out. Kasparov plays b4. A strong move with respect to a6 in this position. Anderson here plays b5, and this sets a trap. This a6, b5 sets a trap. Can white take twice on b5? 
Go ahead and pause the video. If Kasparov takes twice on b5, c takes, a takes, bishop takes, black has a trap here with knight b4. The a pawn is pinned. The knight and bishop are coordinating on c2, on d3. Black is getting play here. And black has no business getting play if we don't take twice on b5. So what does Kasparov do? He takes once on b5. Of course, Anderson takes back. How can white make the threat real to take on b5? Well, you have to unpin the a pawn. And that was the whole point in b4, was to allow the queen's bishop to fianchetto. Bishop b2, the threat is now real on b5. Note how both players have played pawn king 3, which means e3 for white and e6 for black. When that pawn is there, the queen's bishop is limited by the king pawn, which means you may want to seek another diagonal for development of that bishop. So b4 was played to allow bishop b2 meeting this a6 b5 trap with a real threat of simply taking on b5, which black cannot allow. A useful technique to get a feeling for a move is to use the Blumenfeld technique to write down the move before you play it, which is against the rules, so don't do that. But visualize the move or just hear it in your head, the intended move before it's played, to see how you process it, how you feel about it. Now, if we're the black pieces, do we want to play a move in this position, like rook b8, knight a7? Do those sound like good moves for black? No. But you don't have a choice here. So if you're using the Blumenfeld technique and the move strikes you as odd or as bad, it probably is. It's a useful technique. I recommend my total beginners who are not playing tournaments before they get to tournaments. They are learning algebraic notation, they're recording their games, and beginners need practice doing so. And by recording the move before it's played, it lets them use visualization, which is very important. Uh, and also to see if the move is a mistake before it's actually played. It is not legal in tournament play, but for training purposes, I highly recommend the Blumenfeld technique for beginners, yes. So, in this, position Anderson has to make a well he has to make a decision about how to sustain the pawn and there's no good way to do it he plays knight a7 here we see a very shrewd move by Kasparov white to play go ahead and pause the video in all phases of the game be on the lookout for trappable pieces in the opening in the middle game, and even in the end game. Pieces that can be trapped or dominated by pieces of lesser value who have no escape. Which black piece cannot easily get behind their pawns? Well, clearly the bishop on g6. This may well be a trappable piece. It cannot immediately, not right now, get behind the pawns. So what can white do about this? Kasparov plays h4. This threatens to, here's the trappable piece, threatens to play h5. This bishop only has one safe square to move to, f5. And Kasparov would then play g4, sustained by the queen, winning the bishop. Be on the lookout for trappable pieces. h4 is not a move you play willy-nilly. If you move a rook pawn, you need to make a direct threat. Here, there is a direct threat. Otherwise, it's slow. It's inherently slow. It's like half a pawn, only attacks one square. There's very little, if anything, to do with the center, directly or indirectly. h4 threatens to win the bishop. Anderson, of course, sees this and plays h6. Here, we see a move which immensely pertains to the future. You want to think about the future in chess, as in what's going to happen the next couple of moves, the next several moves. On a good day for both sides, 
What do they both want to do over the next couple of moves? Well, on our to-do list, and chess players have a to-do list, milestones we want to achieve in the game, very broad milestones, such as castle, connect the rooks, finish development. We want to check these off our to-do list, things to do in our game of chess that we normally, we normally want to do on a good day. Both sides here want a castle. Now, which direction do you want a castle? Well, you're going king side, of course. The queen side, both, both sides have moved pawns on the queen side that are vulnerable, potentially targetable. There's a lot of empty space on the queen side that can be used to get to the king if it castles in that direction. There is no security for either king on the queen side. That being the case, you do want a castle, and you want a castle short. So, can... Black stop white from castling short. No. There's no way to do it without losing a tremendous amount of material, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about realistically, logically, can black stop white from castling? No. White's going to be able to castle, connect the rooks, take it from there. Can white stop black from castling? Go ahead and pause the video. If white's going to stop black from castling, we need to keep that bishop on f8 as long as possible. How can we do that? By giving it a defensive function. Here we see Kasparov play a remarkable move. We see d5, a positional sacrifice. The bishop on f8 now has a defensive function. It must sustain the g-pawn. Otherwise, the g-pawn will be chopped off and black won't be able to castle at all. So d5 is a wonderful move. The bishop on b2 is a monster on that diagonal. Black now has serious issues with respect to their king's security. Kasparov will be able to castle and then we'll seek to open lines of attack to the black king. Anderson takes this pawn. Kasparov could have played bishop g2 earlier in the game, but now after Anderson takes on d5, Kasparov now plays bishop g2, which gives the bishop multiple targets on the diagonal. That, by the way, Anderson left behind. So the d5 pawn is a target. The rook on a8 is on that diagonal as well. What should Anderson do? Well, once again, this is a difficult decision point to make. Do you want to keep the pawn or not? You should probably not try to keep this pawn. By doing so, and Anderson does keep the pawn, he plays c6. Now, which piece is not very happy about c6? The knight. The knight now has to go back to c8, which it could have done beforehand, but that's just a lot of moving around with the knight that's making realistically no progress at all. So this knight, if it wants to come back into the game, has to go back to c8 and then over to the center or to the king side. So... This is a very limiting move. Black's queen side is a very poor quality. Okay, after c6, we see castle. On a good day, you want to castle before your opponent. So you can get a rook into play, the rook you castled with, into play before the opponent. So you can get both rooks into play before the opponent. Chess players in general, and not in this, not in this tournament, uh, not in the open section, but other chess players in general, use their rooks extremely poorly, or don't use them at all. Around here, a lot of players will knight f3, move the center pawns, bishop f4, bishop blah blah blah, move the other knight, castle, move the queen, and then the rooks just sit there the rest of the game. get a rook into play early without taking on a weakness. There's an old saying, and I don't know who originally said this, but I agree with it a thousand percent. 
if you get your rooks into play before the opponent, your rating goes up 200 points, just like that. Get the rooks into play. You've only got 39 units of force, not counting the king. 39. Both rooks are 10. That's pretty much a quarter of the amount of force that your army has. If you're neglecting your rooks, you're playing at 75% tops. That's not very good. You want the whole army to be working together. Get the rooks into play. Get a rook into play early. Castle before the opponent so you can get a rook into play before the opponent so you can get both rooks into play before the opponent. Look at the games of Paul Morphy. All right, so Kasparov is castled. Clearly his king is safer. The plan is to open lines of attack to the black king. Anderson knows this. Black's king has got to get out of the center. But how do you do that? You can't move the f8 bishop because it has a defensive function. So what to do about the threat on g7? Anderson plays f6. I advise beginning players, unless you're playing a gambit, try not to move the f-pawn in the opening. Don't do it. Now we're in the middle game technically here because once somebody castles, you are then in the middle game. But even then, we probably don't want to move the f-pawn. Now, if you do, just watch your king's security. Watch your king's security on the diagonal h5 to e8 for black. The fool's diagonal. Watch your king's security. And you have to also watch moving from the uncastled position of the king to the king's side. In terms of castling, that may be restricted if you move the f-pawn. As in a bishop on c4 restricts king g8. If you've moved the f-pawn, that is. And there's nothing limiting that diagonal. So f6, not a desirable move, typically. But Anderson needs to get that bishop out of the way so he can castle. So he shields the g-pawn with the f-pawn. He interposes an ally in between the bishop on b2 and the g7-pawn. Kasparov gets a rook into play before the opponent. Let's compare rooks, the king's rooks. Whose rook is better? I think it's quite obvious. The rook on e1 is developed. The counterpart is not. The plan is to play e4 and open lines of attack to get to the black king. Anderson needs to castle ASAP. He plays bishop e7, intending to castle on the next move. When you castle, and the opponent hasn't castled yet, you want to try to prevent them from castling. Can white prevent black from castling here? Go ahead and pause the video. Yes. What are the targets? Well, what's hanging on the board? That's accessible. You can't get to the rook on h8, but you can get to the bishop on g6, and you can get x-ray on the g7 pawn. How do we do that? Queen g4. The bishop moves, the g7 pawn falls. If it doesn't move, the bishop may fall unless it's sustained, which Anderson does. King f7. Okay, the king can no longer castle. We're in the middle game. The theme is peace coordination. And the main strat is to open lines of attack to the opposing king. What do we do here with the white pieces? Well, we've been saving h5 for a rainy day. Now is when we cash that chip in. We're going to play on the white squares because that's the weakest color complex on the king side. And after h5, that bishop has to back off. When you're attacking the king, remove defenders of the king. Kasparov wants to attack on the white squares on black's king side. What's defending those squares? The white square bishop. So we want to trade it off. So what do we play? We play e4. White's idea is after pawn takes to take with the bishop to trade off the defender of the white squares. Keeping that in mind, what should black do here? Should you allow white to trade off your white square bishop? No. You should probably simply play d4. Just give the pawn back. Do not allow the white square bishop to come off the board. Anderson takes. 
And of course, Kasparov takes with the bishop. Anderson takes again. How should Kasparov take back on e4? With the queen, with the rook, or with the knight? Now, the theater of operations is black's kingside. And Kasparov's approach, generally speaking, is to overwhelm the opposing king with superiority of force. He goes for the magic number. In chess, there is a magic number. It is three. We see three all the time, as in here. Kasparov will want to eventually attack just the king with three pieces, which is decisive. If the king is guarded by one ally, then Kasparov will want to attack with three plus one or three plus two. So that way you can trade off the defending ally of the king you're attacking and also potentially sacrifice to open lines to get to that king and still have three on the king. So if you're playing against Kasparov and you're defending your king with two pieces, he might throw six pieces at your king in order to ensure he's got three just on your king when all the dust settles. The magic number is three. We see three all the time. Attacking the king is just one of those three. So he takes with the knight. Now let's compare knights. Whites is in the center. Blacks is on the rim and has to go to the rim again to get back into play. Clearly, white's knight is better. White's king's rook is better. White's queen's rook will be able to join the battle very quickly. White's bishop is better. White's queen is better. White's pieces are much, much better. Knight c8. White to play here. Go ahead and pause the video. What do you suggest? Well, a lot of my students will recommend queen g6 here, which of course is going to be played. We know what moves are going to be played, typically. It's a matter of timing. When do you play the queen g6? Do you play it now? No. White needs to finish development. Invite everybody to the party and make sure they bring gifts. Here, the a1 rook has not yet developed. Kasparov develops it to d1. With a threat in the middle game. He finishes development with a threat in the middle game, coordinating with the queen on d7. Of course, black cannot allow rook takes d7. Black has to sustain the pawn or simply move it to d5. Uh, black plays rook a8. Rook a8 to a7, excuse me. And here, all of white's pieces are optimally placed. White has finished development. He's got five pieces bearing down, able to be brought upon the black king side. We need a way in. What's guarding the king from in front? Well, a pawn and a bishop? So do you have three? The question is, do you have three? The answer is yes. This is white to play and win. After white's queen g4, positionally white is winning here. Tactically, white has a knockout blow, and Kasparov finds it. All his pieces are good to go. Green light, knight f6. Now, if the knight is not captured, let's say black just passes and plays a pointless move, uh, that king is going to be checkmated after queen g6. The knight is, okay, let's say black does nothing here. They pass. We're going to play queen g6 check. That king must go to f8. There's no choice. And then knight takes d7 check. Discovering the bishop's attack on the g7 pawn. So knight takes d7 check. The queen will take or the rook will take. It doesn't matter. And Kasparov's reply will be bishop takes g7 check, the king will go to g8, and then bishop takes h6 checkmate. So this knight must be captured. How should Anderson capture the knight? Go ahead and pause the video. It doesn't matter how he captures it, it's losing, but one way is big time losing compared to the other. If you take with the bishop, 
white to play and win very quickly. Go ahead and pause the video. Here we would see queen g6 check. This king goes to f8 and the bishop will chop on f6. Of course, the queen cannot take on f6 because of rook e8 checkmate. So the pawn would have to take. And here, how do we continue the pressure on black? Go ahead and pause the video. We've got rook e6 utilizing the pin on the d file. That rook is going to chop on f6 on the next move, and black's going to be losing their queen. This is completely lost for black. So after knight takes, black must take with the g pawn. There is no other choice. So g takes. Okay, how do we continue with white? Well, now we've got queen g6. This king backs off to f8. And this is one of my most favorite moves in any game. I very much enjoy this move because it's a huge blind spot for many chess players. That's a hint. White to play. What do you do? Go ahead and pause the video. What's the target that leads to the king? Well, you could go around the f file with the rook lift and slide a rook onto g4. You can do that. But if you want the target that directly leads to the king, we're looking at the h6 pawn. It is defended once, it's attacked once, it's isolated, and it can't move. How do we target that pawn again? With a move that categorically many chess players will never consider. Because, quote, it's moving backwards, it's a retreating move. No, it isn't. Bishop c1 is repositioning the bishop. This is actually going forward from that point of view. That bishop, at any time white wants, will snap that h6 pawn off the board. And that king is in a lot of trouble on the king side. So bishop c1 is fantastic. Many chess players are looking to just go forward, forward, forward. A move that goes physically backwards may be a blind spot for many chess players. I very much like bishop c1. Okay, so we see d5. Now, note how Kasparov has sacked a piece, but here shows tremendous control of the position and restraint. Now, he can play bishop h6, and he just sacked a piece. So normally, after you sack, it's go, go, go. No, no, no. Here, we see a very strong move. Now, bishop h6 is coming anytime he wants. The e1 rook is awesome. What about the other rook? It's not doing enough. After rook d4, we know where it's going next. Rooks like to go vertical, then horizontal. I learned that from Coach Bruce. This rook is going to g4, and all of a sudden, queen g7 is in the mix. This is just completely falling apart for black's king side. This is a very cool move, as in Kasparov is extremely relaxed, he's comfortable, his position is completely dominant, and he knows this. He can take his time. Positionally, he can take his time. Tactically, he can take his time. Improve this rook. Tremendous move. We see knight d6. And Kasparov is consistent and plays rook g4. Rooks like to go vertical and horizontal. Rook lift and go horizontal. Anderson's knight goes to f7. Is it in time to meet the threat on h6? Go ahead and pause the video. The answer is no. Bishop takes h6. If the rook takes, well, you get checkmated on g8. So the knight takes? No, because then you've got queen g7. So this bishop cannot be touched. Knight takes, bam. Rook takes, just to illustrate it for those of us need to visualize it. Here we go. So that bishop cannot be touched. So we see king e8. White to play. This is the last move of the game. Go ahead and pause the video. White has a threat that cannot be stopped. What is it? What is white's winning piece or pawn that's unstoppable? It's the H-pawn. 
Black cannot stop the advance of the h-pawn after bishop g7. If the rook stays there, you take it. If it moves, you just throw the h-pawn up the board, and there's nothing that Black can do to stop this. Anderson resigns. So what happens in this game? We see Anderson invade very early. Kasparov treats the invading piece on e4 as a target, no matter what piece it is. And Anderson leaves space behind when the bishop withdraws from the long white diagonal. Kasparov prepares to take it. Anderson goes to set a trap by playing weak, bad moves. Kasparov doesn't fall for it. So Anderson has to continue to play awkwardly bad moves in order to keep the material that he tried to set a trap with because it backfired. We want to set traps naturally by playing good moves. So Kasparov then positionally sacks a pawn in order to complicate Black's ability to castle. And Black, in fact, never castles in this game. Kasparov's able to castle. So keep the future in mind. The next couple of moves, the next several moves, what's going to happen? What can I do about it? D5 was brilliant. So Kasparov castles and then prepares to open lines of attack to the opposing king via his rook on E1. He gets a rook into play before the opponent. We see, look at this position here. We see Kasparov have both rooks in play offensively, not reacting defensively. Rook A7, is it in the game? Yeah but not really. It's out of play. It's just a reactionary move. That king's rook does nothing the entire game. Get your rooks into play. Get your rooks into play. So Kasparov gets his king's rook in play and trades off the defender of the white squares on black's king side, remove defenders of the king, and then has a decisive attack. He's got five on one in a pawn. The math is fuzzy, but Kasparov has three. He has three. His pieces are optimally placed. Green light, he has a tactical combination with knight takes f6, which threatens checkmate in four, if not handled properly. Uh, so that knight has to be captured. There's one really terrible way to take, which we don't see Anderson do. Uh, and after recapturing on f6 with a g-pawn, we see the beautiful bishop c1, a perhaps appearing to be a retreating move, which isn't at all. It's going forward. Physically, it's going backwards, but it's going forward to reposition the bishop to snatch that h6-pawn off the board, which when done, all of a sudden, white's h-pawn has no counterpart. It's a passed pawn. Passed pawns must be pushed. So after bishop c1, Kasparov rook lifts. He's in total control of the position after sacrificing. He's not in a hurry. He has full control. Black has nothing. We see a rook lift. Rooks like to go vertical and horizontal. And then a nice finish. The bishop snack, uh, you know, snags the pawn on h6. And after bishop g7, it's, it's curtains for black. A very strong game with many nice ideas. This is a great game to lecture for, maybe not complete beginning classes, but beginners to show them the strength of the rooks, the importance of castling, the importance of getting a rook into play early, the importance of getting both rooks into play, the principle of aggression, the d5 sacrifice, keeping the future in mind, the tactical knight takes f6, for calculation purposes. The importance of x-ray here with respect to the rooks. Uh, this is a very fun game. I'd like to thank Grandmaster Sarawan for uh, that book and that series of books in addition to everything else he's contributed to. Uh, that's the first time I ex was exposed to this game and I've enjoyed it ever since. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, I do like Ulf Anderson. I've never met either player. Uh, I respect him a thousand percent, uh, but in this game, uh, he, he makes some questionable decisions, and Kasparov really doesn't. That's it for this lecture. I don't know how often these 
longer videos will be uploaded. This does take a considerable amount of time to execute properly. I don't do any video editing during these. It's a straight live shot and just one take. Uh, so if I do misstep, I will have to shoot the whole thing over again. So we'll see how many of these I can get up, uh, but they will be intended for students to prepare them for open section play. These longer videos, my lectures, will be for the U2200 crowd. I do welcome all feedback, and this material is to be used by students from anywhere, anytime, any place, past, present, future students of mine, and for other coaches and trainers to use to help their students prepare for open section play, and for anybody who enjoys a strong game of chess. That's going to do it. Thank you for watching.